Hello everyone, I'm Norman Welberger and thanks for joining me on this adventure towards solving general polynomial equations. Today, numerical solutions of quintic equations using bootstrapping. So first we'll just review the theoretical setup and then we'll turn to Mathematica and see that these theoretical algebraic expressions actually provide a very powerful and direct way of obtaining numerical solutions for these quintic equations. But they don't automatically work, so we have to adjust our approach depending on the nature of the coefficients. And that's where this bootstrapping idea comes in. Okay, so let's review. It's very parallel to what we've already done in the quadratic and the cubic cases. So I hope you've been following that along and you'll be able to relatively quickly understand that what I'm doing now is just a direct generalization of those earlier examples. So first of all, our RSP numbers. These are these coefficients which play the crucial role um, and they're defined in the usual way. And then we start with the geometric cubic that has a special form one minus x and so on. And here is our formula for it, which is beautifully just a power series in the coefficients t2 up to t5, whose coefficients are these r numbers, these RSP numbers. Now, first order of business is to move to the more general equation where we have something of the form C0 minus C1y plus C2y squared and so on equals zero. So how do we transition from this equation, which we're calling equation one, to this equation, which we're calling equation two? Okay, we're making changes of variables. First of all, the x is going to be replaced with C1 over C0y. And we're going to replace the T2, T3, T5 variables with these expressions. Have a look at this. T2 is C0, C2 over C1 squared. T3 is C0 squared, C3 over C1 cubed. T sub 4 is C0 cubed, C4 over C1 to the fourth. C sub 5 equals C0 to the fourth, C sub 5 over C1 to the fifth. Okay, now to explain where we got that from, well, you should go back to the cubic and look at that very carefully, okay? And when we do all these substitutions into here, what does it become? Well, the one minus x, there's the new x, c1 over c0y, and we've replaced all of these x's with that same expression. And then we plug in these t's, so there's t2, and there's t3, and there's t4, and there's t5. And what happens when we simplify this? Well, if you look at the power of C1 in one of these expressions, lay this one here, there's a C1 cubed, and there's a C1 cubed in the denominator, so they all cancel. And the C0s, well, there's a C0 squared, and there's a C0 cubed in the denominator, so altogether that's like one over C0. So there'll be a one over C0 in each one of these expressions, so if we multiply everything through by C0, we'll just get this C0 and then other terms which don't have any C0s. And if you look at see what the other terms are, well, after we multiply through by C0, we're gonna have minus C1y. And over here, all what's going to remain is the C2. That's the only thing that hasn't canceled. And over here, the only thing that's gonna remain is the C3. Here C4 and here C5. So yes, indeed, we definitely get equation two after we've made these substitutions into equation one. Well, that means that we can read off a solution to this general equation from the solution of the simpler geometric form. Okay, we just carry on with the substitutions. So the solution is, let's scroll down here. Where's our cursor? There, okay. Um, so the solution is, here it is right here. Okay, so what do we get? Well, we just get this thing here where we have to replace the T2 up to T5 with the corresponding expressions here. So there's T2, there's T3, there's T4, there's T5, raised to the appropriate powers. Then there's a C0 over C1 in front. And the coefficient is, as usual, the RSP number R. Conclusion, then, is we get what we might call the mega theorem for the quintic. Okay, that the solution of this quintic in this form is given by this expression. Y is a certain function of the coefficients C0 to C5. 
And if we look to see how many C0s and everything else there are, the total number of C0s in the numerator is one from this term plus M2 plus 2M3 plus 3M4 plus 4M5. That's the reason why that exponent is the way it is. And the C2, C3, C4, and C5 terms, they're just directly just the associated powers. And the C1, well, there's one of them down here in this denominator, and then there's 2M2, 3M3, 4M4, and 5M5. That explains that exponent there. And we're going to call this big sum K. Okay, so it's an expression involving the coefficients. So this is like the holy grail, right? We want a formula for the solution in terms of the coefficients in a very, very general way. So it just depends on the coefficients. Now, the question is, you know, what about the interpretation? Well, I've already explained to you how we can interpret this kind of thing algebraically. Now we want to show that it also can be used for numerical calculations of approximate zeros. Okay, so here is Mathematica, okay? And we're going to apply the formulas that we've um, laid out here. And just to start with, I'm just putting this little blurb here. This is just a little sequence of uh, things that, uh, that get Mathematica to agree that zero to the zero is equal to one. I want that because in certain situations when we're evaluating some things, we have certain things raised to certain powers, and the powers are sometimes zero, and the things that we're going to plug in can also be sometimes zero, and I want Mathematica to evaluate that as zero, so this explicitly uh, tells it that. Tells it that. Oh, see, so here I haven't actually run it. So it says, you know, if you if you just evaluate this thing here, indeterminate expression encountered. So now I'm going to go here and I'm going to run this thing. And now I'm going to run this. And now Mathematica agrees that that's equal to 1. So that's the effect of this little uh, sequence of commands. Okay, so let's get to it. First of all, first order of business, defining the RSP numbers are. So this is direct thing here. You will note that I'm not using subscripts. Maybe just say a word about that. So subscripts are nice to look at, but generally when you're working with Mathematica, it's probably better to not use subscripts, to stick with variables that have sort of simple names, just like M2, M3, even though it doesn't quite look as pretty, okay? You're less likely to run into problems. So that's what we're gonna do. So here's our and it's defined in the, the way that you're all familiar. There's the factorial for the numerator, the one in the denominator consisting of this thing, and the factorials of the individual m's from m2 to m5. Okay, let's run that so we know what r is. Let's just check, okay, r of something, one, three, two, six. What is that? Okay, it's some big number, excellent. Okay, so it knows what r is. So let's delete that. Okay, so now let's go to f. So here is the f function. Remember that was the um, solution to the to the geometric quintic, okay, the one involving t's. So it's a sum over r of m2, m3, m4, m5, and it's a pure power series in t2, t3, t4, and t5. And these brackets here just tell Mathematica the range of uh, summation values for each of these indices. So this really is a quadruple sum because there's four things that are being uh, summed over, M2, M3, M4, and M5. So let us control enter that. Great, and the more general solution involved that K function. Remember that involved all the coefficients of the general thing. So that's a function of C0 up to C5, defined in a similar kind of way. C0 to the 1 plus M2 plus 2M3, etc. The C2, C3, C4, and C5 terms, appearing with the usual factorials. And the C1 to the 1 plus 2M2 plus 3M3 plus 4M4 plus 5M5. Okay, that's what we're summing. And again, we'll let uh, M2, M3, M4, and M5 range, say, from 0 to 6. Okay, are we happy with that? So, boom. Okay, so now we have 
the basic numerical engines ready to go. Let's see if we can solve some quintics. Okay, so some numerical examples of the geometric quintic. So let's start with uh, a geometric quintic. So that's a relatively simple. So solve, um, so the equation is something like one minus x, I'll say plus uh, two x squared minus x cubed plus uh, three x to the four um, plus x to the five. Okay, we might solve that for x. But I want a numerical um, solution, so I'm going to put n solve here. Okay, so let's see what happens. Okay, I get some solutions. I get some complex solutions, actually. Oh, yeah, four of them, and one approximate rational solution. Try to avoid saying real solution. It's not a real number. It's just a finite decimal, which is an approximate solution to this thing. Okay, so let's see if our method might have gotten that. How would we try to get that? All right, so let's see if our basic formula will come up with this. So remember, for the f function, we're just inputting the coefficients of x squared up to x to the 5. So that's 2, minus 1, 3, and 1. Okay, that is a big number. That is nowhere close to what we're, what we're interested in. Okay, and of course we're not surprised because our series is a power series in, in, in these things here, okay? And that thing is not likely to be converging to anything useful unless these numbers here are small, okay? So this is not, not close. So let's, um, let me, I'll keep this thing here and we'll just look at another variant. Okay, let's do the same thing, but I'm going to modify the, the coefficients now. So I'm going to put in some fractions. One, say, seventh. Um, fraction, one quarter. Fraction, one third. Fraction, one one, let's see, 10. Okay, and let's solve that now. Okay, so now let's uh, calculate the answer from the formula. So that involves the coefficients uh, 1 seventh, and then uh, we had minus 1 quarter, and then um, 1 third, and then Oops, sorry, one third and then one tenth. Okay, and I want to evaluate that numerically. So numerical evaluation is like an N. So I'm going to put an N in front of that and evaluate numerically. So that's that's a very big thing. Okay, that's still, uh, our method is still not uh, working. And Probably it's because these numbers are not yet small enough to get convergence. So I'm going to just modify things up here. Um, I just want to see if this thing is converging to something if the coefficients are sort of, say, suitable. So I'm just going to multiply all of these by 10. And I'm going to reevaluate this. Okay, now the solution is minus 4.91 and some other stuff. And over here, now I can quickly just go over here and modify these. I'm just multiplying them all by 10. And I'm going to rerun this. And I'm getting 1.03821. Oh, actually, but wait, that is, that is one of the solutions. So the, the thing has changed. It's not just this solution. There's also this one over here. 1.03821, so we're actually getting that. And now I'm kind of interested in well, how close are we? Okay, because it's all just approximate, so let's try to uh, involve some precision. The way we do that is we, in the end solve, we just add an extra uh, factor, which is the number of digits in the, in the answer. So now we have the answer to this quintic. Um, to 10 decimal places. And now let's calculate this. I can do correspondingly, just put a comma and a 10 there, and hopefully it will calculate that. 
And what do I see? Uh, 1.038211585309. So we're within, uh, we have six decimal places of accuracy. Great. So I think we can, uh, we can conclude that our F function is, is working okay. So now I want to go to the, to the general case and look at a more general quintic. Okay, so now let's have a look at the general quintic, okay, where we have rather arbitrary uh, coefficients. Maybe I'll make this one uh, three. Three minus eight x plus x squared minus two x cubed plus x to the fourth plus three x to the fifth equals zero. We want to solve that for x numerically. Okay, and we see we have um, three, three uh, zeros. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, First of all, can we, um, can we find this using our k function, okay? So let's look at n, that's evaluation, um, then k, and then the coefficients are going to be 3, 8, I have to ignore the minus sign there, and then 1, and then minus 2, and then 1, and then 3. All right, and one more bracket. So let's evaluate that we get 0.385194, excellent. Okay, that's good agreement with, with this, this value here. In fact, if I wanted to just see how good agreement it is, I could go up to say 10 places, and I could also go up to 10 places here. And uh, now how's the agreement? 385190, so up to, um, up to about uh, five decimal places. Okay, that's good. Now. What about, well, first of all, one of the reasons why this thing worked is because this, this 8 here, right, uh, is a little bit bigger than the other ones. So that's, I've arranged that, so I wanted to check whether this thing is going to give me the answer that I know it should give me if the coefficients are kind of well chosen for our method. So what happens if that's not the case? So let's have another look. Um, We'll modify this. We'll make this uh, eight much more modest, say maybe just um, four. Now it's comparable with um, the other ones. And let's see if uh, we still get something. So first of all, we'll solve it, and then we'll <clears throat> uh, we'll have a look at this. We can change this eight to a four, okay, and see what we get. We get something ten to the minus ten to the fourteen. So obviously that's far off. All right, so how could we modify our, our strategy now to try to get at a zero in this more general situation where we do not have the favorable situation of having a, a big a C1 term compared to the others? Well, bootstrapping is, is one way of thinking about this, okay? Now what we should do is we should first look for an approximate uh, zero and then then move towards that, okay? so. An approximate zero is, say, minus 1.5. So let's define, uh, say, a function g of x. Uh, g of x will be equal to, and this is what we're going to take. All right. That's our function. Let's define that. And now we're going to look at expanding a translate of that. So we're going to translate that function by an approximate zero. So we uh, let's look at the approximate zero minus 1.5. That's an approximate zero to g. Okay, so let's just check that. What's g of minus 1.5? That is 0.28125. Okay, you know, it, it, it's pretty close to zero. Okay, fine. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, instead of calculating that, I'm going to calculate g of x minus 1.5, okay? And I'm going, well, let me just do that. If I just do that, I get this thing here, but I want to actually expand that, so let me expand it right off the bat. Expand, okay. So have a look, I'm getting a new quintic, but crucially, you see this constant term was the value of g of minus 1.5 that we just calculated, 0.281. And that's not really small, but it's smaller than the other ones. So 
there's a good chance that that's going to help us in having a series which is um, kind of converging to something. So let's uh, go here and let's go down and let's now replace these things here with say 0 0.28, 125, and then 41. I better put a minus sign here. Minus 41.9375. We probably don't need all these digits, but anyway, minus 77.75, and then 59.5, and 21.5, and finally 3. Do I have them all right? That one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Oh, there's a minus sign there, sorry. Minus 21.5, and 3. All right, let's evaluate that thing. Minus 0 0.006264.63. Now, what am I going to do with that? Well, I'm going to add that to minus 1.5. Okay, so if I take minus 1.5, 1.5, and I add what I just got, I get minus 1.5006.62, 0, 0, which is... Um, what I'm getting here to five decimal places. So this is a demonstration of how bootstrapping can get you closer to a zero once you know you have an approximate zero. And this might also be useful. I mean, if we had a an example where we had, say, more than just one rational or approximate rational solution let's say let's say we have about five approximate rational solutions that we might be able to obtain um, more than just one of them by 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 starting uh, with uh, giving one of these seed values which is close to to one of these and then hopefully it will it will converge to um to the one that we're interested in so in summary i think this shows that our, our formulas are essentially correct uh, there's still a very big question of you know how to efficiently um, create a, a technology that actually helps us solve numerical solutions in general, right? So, you know, so what do we do depending on the nature of the coefficients? But overall, we have now a, a mega solution that covers both the algebraic side of things and is pretty effective on the numerical side. So I think that's a, a cause for, um, for celebration.